Hey, 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 ladies, Regina Phillips here, and I'm back with another episode of Kingdom Car Chronicles. I pray that all of you are having a blessed Wednesday. I know that I am, and I'm excited to be able to share this word with you today. So y'all, on Monday, we started talking about um, myths, uh, myth busters, as it relates to spiritual warfare and deliverance. And so on Monday, we talked about um, the notion that the battle doesn't belong to us and the battle is the Lord's and applying that across the board to all of our battles. Um, a lot of ministers have taken the scripture out of Second Chronicles where God told King Jehoshaphat, Judah, and the inhabitants of Jerusalem that that particular battle uh, that they were facing was not theirs, that it was the Lord's and that they would not need to fight in that battle. But taking that scripture and applying it across the board has caused so many Christians to operate in passivity, therefore being defeated in their lives. And I just wanted to let you guys know that um, it was talking about that particular battle, but there are so many scriptures um, that we can read to show that we cannot live a passive life as a Christian. And there's a lot of things that we have to do that God has commissioned us to do and give, given us the power and authority to do. Um we also talked about uh, the misunderstanding that that Satan is defeated. Um, well, Jesus defeated the works of the devil with the cross. And so he destroyed the works, the ones that sometimes we still get tripped up on uh, and we sometimes still remain in bondage, even though we're free to go. Those are the what, what Jesus defeated on the cross or that's where Satan has been defeated. But Satan is not yet chained up. Um, he's not in the bottomless pit. He's not in hell. He's still roaming about. He remains the God of this world and he rules as the prince of the power of the air. Um, but we, the church... That's us. We've been commissioned to destroy him and his gates. And y'all, I just wanted to remind you that God has not called us to debate deliverance, but to do it. For these signs shall follow those who believe. In my name shall they cast out demons, Mark 16 and 17. Jesus came to set the captives free and deliverance is the children's bread, which brings us to the message for today. Um, so the myth that I want to dispel uh, for you guys on today is Christians cannot have demons. If Christians cannot have demons, how so then is deliverance the children's bread? Um, there is absolutely no distinction made in the Bible between believers and unbelievers having demons or being influenced by demons. The reason is both alike can have demons. We're going to look at Matthew chapter 15 verses 21 through 28. Uh, this passage of scripture is talking about um, a, a, the Syrophoenician woman, uh, she came to Jesus um, and she she asked him to heal her daughter who was grievously vexed with the devil. So the Syrophoenician woman, she was a Gentile. She wasn't a Jew, um, but Jesus was there and he was uh, performing these works or healing the Jews. And this Syrophoenician woman, she came to him so that her daughter who was vexed with the devil could be healed. So she was grievously vexed. Vexed uh, means exercised or controlled. So her daughter was... Um, being control or the the devil or the demon that was in this child was um, exercising its control over her, and her mom wanted her healed, which makes sense. But when she came to Jesus, he answered her not at first. Uh, verse twenty three, and his disciples came and they were like, you know, send her away. She's crying after us. Send her away because she was a Gentile. Uh, but she answered and said, but he answered and said, this is Jesus. I am not sent, but unto the lost sheep of the house of Israel. So what does this mean? So God's plan was to offer salvation first 
um, and this included healing to the Jews before going to the Gentiles. God planned the same blessing for the Gentiles, but uh, it was for the, the Jews uh, first. Um, and so then she, then came she, or she came and she worshiped him saying, Lord, help me. So she asked him again, the first time he ignored her, the disciples said to send her away. And he said to them, I'm not sent, but into the lost house of the, uh, the lost sheep of the house of Israel. So I'm, I'm here for the children of Israel. I'm here for the Jews, uh, right now. And so then she came and worshiped him and said, Lord, help me. She asked him again to help her. Um, and Jesus said to her, it is not meat to take the children's bread and cast it to the dogs. And so that can definitely be taken like, man, he just pretty much dissed her. Uh, but what he was saying is... Um, the Jews were the first children of the kingdom. And so what is their bread? He said, it's not common or it's not uh, right for me to take away the children's bread and cast it to the dogs. So their bread, the bread here refers to the benefits that the Messiah was to bring to them, which included salvation for the body, salvation for their soul and spirit, salvation from sin, sickness, demons, and satanic power. So there it is. The, the, that was the children's bread. And so um, the children's bread, he said he couldn't take it from them and cast it to the dogs. So why would he say cast it to the dogs? Well, let me help you understand that the Gentiles were called dogs by the Jews and so Christ merely used the common speech of his people. So he was just basically speaking the way that they speak. In the East, during this time, dogs were not cared for. And so the term was not an offensive term. So he didn't say it as in offending her or calling her a dog or saying that she was a dog. So it wasn't an offensive term. It merely expressed the fact that at this particular time, Gentiles were outside of the covenant rights of Israel. So they did not yet have right to the children's bread. Um, and so she said, yes, this is true, Lord. But even the dogs um, eat the crumbs which falls from the master's table. So she was expressing her faith here. And this is why Jesus didn't answer her initially. He was wanting to see where her faith lied. And so... Uh, her faith was that, you know, even the dogs eat the crumbs from the master's table. So she, she expressed that she knew that he had the power to heal her daughter. She had that much faith in him. She knew who he was and she believed that he had the power to heal her daughter. And he answered and said, oh woman, great is thy faith. Be it unto thee, even as thy will. So I want to say here that all believers are promised what they want and they govern their own supply by their faith. And so in that particular passage, what I want to take away is the children's bread. So he said the, the children's bread uh, was for the house of Israel. And he couldn't take it and give it to take it away from the Jews and give it to the Gentile. So what was this children's bread? Um, it was salvation for the body, soul, and spirit, salvation from sickness, uh, demons, and satanic powers. For God's own, it was the children's bread was for God's own sons and daughters purchased by the blood of Jesus. So this makes a distinction as to who is qualified for deliverance or who uh, the children's bread is for. It's for God's children. It's for believers. Now let's look at Luke 11, 24 and 26. And I'm going to paraphrase here. Um, it's talking about an unclean spirit. Uh, when it goes out of a man, it walks through dry places, seeking rest. It finds no rest. So it returns to the house or the person that it came from. It finds that inside that person is empty, swept, and garnished. And so it returns to that person with seven spirits more wicked than itself. And the state of that person is worse off than it initially was. So um, Jesus, uh, right before this particular passage, further up, um, Jesus had just um, cast a dumb spirit out of a person. And so um, 
the Jewish audience believed that he had done this, casting out that dumb spirit. They believed that he had done this through the power of the chief devil, Beelzebub. Um, and so he said to them, he said, if, if this is true, then Satan's kingdom is divided against itself and it cannot stand. But with the finger of God, if I cast out devils, no doubt the kingdom of God is come upon you. So these were Jews with a religion of negatives. They had um, a lot of, they just had a lot of negative things removed or were, were removing negative things from their lives, but they had not put nothing positive in its place. And so to help them understand the importance of that, Jesus use this particular story uh, to help them baby basically just giving them a better illustration so that they would understand that um, nothing positive put into place uh, where negative things or uh, something bad has been removed is just like a man uh, being delivered and demons uh, being delivered from demons um, who do not put in anything positive in its place and end up worse than they were, okay? So how then can an unbeliever be delivered of demons and then be expected to fill his house or fill his temple with spiritual resources that he doesn't have because he's an unbeliever? He's not a child of God, so he wouldn't have the spiritual resources needed to fill his house to keep those uh, those spirits or those demons from coming back to the house that they left. Salvation is the first step. So becoming saved and accepting Jesus as our Lord and Savior, then we become children of God, and then we have access to the children's bread. Then cleaning the temple um, of unclean things is possible. Therefore, deliverance is meant to be ministered to Christians. Um, of course, the first step for those who aren't Christians are, is salvation. Now, let's look at 1 Corinthians 6 and 19. It says that our body is the temple of the Holy Ghost, which is in you. So areas, um, there's three different areas to the temple. Like there are three th different, we have three different parts. We are a three-part being. We are body, spirit, and soul. And that's parallel to the temple, which has an outer court, the holy place, and the holy of holies. So once the temple was dedicated um, to God, God's presence indwelled the holy of holies. When we are saved, our spirits were quickened and indwelled by God. Um, almost like having our personal holy of holy. So Holy Spirit lives inside of us when we become saved. Although God's presence filled the holy of holies in the Old Testament, Jesus still had to cleanse the temple during his earthly ministry. He cast out um, all that defiled the temple. So I want you to take note, note that only the outer court needed cleansing. Um, it had become a den of thieves, according to Matthew 21 and 13. So God's presence was still in the temple, in the holies of holies, yet the temple was deemed to be unclean. So why wouldn't we need to drive out uncleanliness? Deliverance is the children's bread. Matthew chapter 8, verse 16 through 17, talks about deliverance and healing of healing are provisions of Christ's atoning blood. The benefits of the cross are for those who accept, and you can only accept something that you believe. So it's for those who accept the work of the cross, and the work of the cross is eternal salvation healing, and deliverance. So let's look at this scripture. Matthew chapter 8, verse 16 through 17. When evening came, many who were demon-possessed were brought to him, and he drove out the spirits with a word and healed all the sick. This was to fulfill what was spoken through the prophet Isaiah, which was, he took up our infirmities and bore our diseases. If it were impossible for a Christian to have a demon or be under the influence of a demon, then neither could he become sick. 
for both healing and deliverance are benefits of accepting the work of the cross according to this scripture Matthew chapter 8 verse 16 and 17 so what am I saying it is better for you people of God to identify and acknowledge if you do have an unclean spirit and cast it out in Jesus name rather than deny that you have a demon and keep it which is pride and that's Satan's ultimate place to work it's his goal and it's his doctrine for us to believe that we can't be uh, we can't have demons or we can't be influenced by demons whatever torments you is most likely rooted in some form of demonic bondage so identify that thing and be set free the last thing I want to share with you guys is 2 Corinthians 10 3 through 5 this is a verse addressed directly to Christians, di directly, directly um, addressed to the children of God. And it talks about spiritual weapons um, to pull down strongholds. It tells us that the uh, weapons of our warfare are not carnal, but they're mighty through God's pulling down of strongholds. Strongholds are in our mind, and these will be demonic strongholds. So, um, if we cannot be influenced by demons, why do we need weapons for demonic strongholds? As Christians, demons cannot come in and overtake our temple, but they can defile it. They can vex us by exercising their power. And until we believe that, so many people will remain in bondage. So the myth that Christians cannot have demons is not true. Y'all, that's all I have for today. I pray that this was an insightful blessing to you. If you don't remember anything else, please remember that I love you. God bless. Hey there, thank you so much for watching this video. I pray that it was a blessing to you. And if it was, please hit the like button and don't forget to share with someone that you know that it would also be a blessing to. Also, don't forget to subscribe to the channel. And if you wanna be notified when I upload new content, hit the little bell next to the subscribe button. Again, thank you so much for your time and I look forward to sharing more with you. God bless.